Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, I, everybody out there in all things LGBTQ world. Um, today we're interviewing William Will Rear. And um, so let me read a little bio. Welcome, William. Thank you. Do you want to go by William or Will? I prefer Will. It's easier that way. Okay. <laughs> so Will was born in Nac Nacogdoches, Texas, on January 15, and represents Burling Bennington Two House District that includes the town of Bennington, North Bennington, the village of Old Bennington, and he resides in uh, North Bennington um, and lives with his closest friend, Jane, and their adored feline, Basil. Uh, Greer has two younger sisters, um, Caroline and Elizabeth, and his father, uh, I, I guess it's, let me see, his mother, Misty, operates the family's fifth generation sawmill in East Texas. His stepfather owns the land title insurance company and manages the family ranch. His father, Brad, owned a railroad contracting business for 31 years. He graduated from Lamar Academy in 2021. Um, he earned a BA from Bennington College in 2024, concentrating in public administration. He's traveled all over the world, America, Europe, Africa, on behalf of many organizations concerning democracy, women's right, rights, and Arctic policy. Currently, he serves as Justice of the Peace in the town of Bennington, High Bailiff of Bennington County, and Secretary of the Mont Democratic Party. Formerly, he served as Vice Chair of the Community Policy Advocacy Review Board in the town of Bennington. He is the second youngest LGBTQ plus legislator elected in American history. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Linda. And sorry I had to make you read all that bio. But... <laughs> oh, that's great. It's very informative. So, so um, what did you kind of learn, do you think, by, by traveling all over the world? Did it give you some kind of a, um, a bigger perspective on where we are in our country and the rest of the world? It did. Um, I think that's actually one of the reasons I decided to run for office when the opportunity presented itself, um, especially when I was in Africa and other parts of the United States. I just realized how lucky we are in Vermont um, and how we have a very open democracy where everyone's able to participate. Um, we encourage it um, and we have to make sure that it's there for future generations. So when I decided to run, you know, having the experience that I had in Montpelier, um, working in varieties of uh, different things in the capital, um, it really, it put into perspective with all the travel I had done, seeing it in action up, upstate, um, it just made me really, you know, really grateful for where we are. And then it really gave me that boost to run for office. And so you came here from Texas to go to school. I did. So I originally, I started actually as a creative writing major. So I, I came up here wanting to write short stories and poetry. And I told my mother, I said, I'm not going to get involved in politics in Vermont. And within like about six months, I ended up getting involved in politics in Vermont. And my mother, of course, said that didn't last as long as you had thought it would. But anyway, I got involved. Um, you know, the, the, the bait was out there. I just got really involved with several organizations and I just loved being part of our town's civic life and just, you know, the, the political aspect of it and just the social, you know, all the organizations and issues I was getting involved with. Um, and I haven't looked back since. I go back to Texas though for holidays, I, I, will, I will admit that, but I will be celebrating my first Christmas uh, actually in Vermont because of the the swearing in the inauguration. Usually I'm in Texas with my little sisters. As you mentioned, I have two younger sisters. 
and the family. And we're usually out at the ranch. So that's usually my annual retreat. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to be here, hopefully for a winter and snowy build for Mott for Christmas. We can only, we can only hope at this point. I mean, it's been, it's been pretty long this year. We've been waiting. Uh, I know. And usually it snows here by Christmas, but you know, who knows now, you know, I mean, there's so much climate change and yeah. you know, that, you know, this has been a very warm November. Um, so <clears throat> are you, is your family political? Is that how you got the pol political bug? So, yes. So my mother now runs um, the family sawmill, but she actually was the one that was political. So she actually worked in the opposite party. So she's still a Republican, has always been a Republican. Um, and despite being a Democrat, we always have had really good, passionate debates and passionate discussions about policy and issues um, ranging and, you know, whatever we can come up with and we make up for the day. But she did, uh, she did work in uh, Austin with the state legislature there for many years. Um, she was worked with a state representative and then she also worked for a state senator. So I think in total for about eight years, she was in Austin doing that. I love Austin. Great town. Yeah, I was going to say it's great. <laughs> yeah. So you don't get into a lot of political arguments with her then, huh? No, I think that's one, another reason why I was encouraged to run and kind of why I felt, you know, someone like me and my voice would be needed in Montpelier. I've been used to growing up in more conservative backgrounds. My family's primarily Republican, but I always had my own ideas. But even, you know, having strong held beliefs and opinions, I always was able to rationalize and compromise and really find that solution where everyone was happy. And now you're not always going to make everyone happy, but I think <laughs> that it's worth, it's worth a shot at least to make sure that everyone knows their voices matter and that their input matters and that we can try and make it in. And it's never going to just be, you know, clear cut, you know, and squeeze it in, you know, one way or another. It's going to, you know, it's going to involve, you know, getting everyone together and figuring out how it all pieces together. So given that and the last election that we just had for president, um, how do you see your role in protecting Vermonters from my, what might be, uh, could be an onslaught of, negative policies towards LGBTQ people, uh, immigrants. I mean, every, a lot of people could and may be threatened by this election. So how do we give people hope and what do you plan on trying to do for Vermont? Yeah. So I'm, I'm an optimist, I think, when it comes to policy and how governance works. Um, I hope that we can work with the Trump administration to ensure that we can protect these. Uh, major issues. I mean, we're talking about union rights. We're talking about LGBTQ rights. We're talking about the right to marry. We're talking about the right to access abortion, IVF, so many issues. I'm hoping that when we get to Montpelier, you know, Vermont has already, you know, well established with Prop 5, but also with legislation prior, the right to access reproductive care. But I think we really have to make sure that IVF is protected in 2025, because that kind of came up Kind of out of nowhere, I felt like in 2024 when we had the case out of Alabama and we had some legislation being introduced in Washington. So really, we're going to see our state capitals kind of at the front lines of protecting these you know, certain certain issues and certain rights for people in our community. Uh, when it comes to the right to marry, you know, Vermont led the way on it. I'm also proud. Uh, this was another fun fact I found out that I'm the first person to serve in the legislature after the adoption of civil unions. And so to be in this body that you know fought so hard and had so many fierce and some can say nasty debates around gay rights and gay people and whether or not we want them in Vermont, you know, it's almost like I'm, I feel like I'm living that history and to continue that and to make sure that Vermont still has those rights for the next 24 years, that's so important to me. And, 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 you know, like just in the off sense that it goes to the Supreme Court and gay marriage is ended, yep. just the way abortion was. Yep. <clears throat> um, I guess we'll, we'll deal with that now, but would you be in favor of like trying to keep the law in the state, even though the country may not allow it anymore? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, first of all, there's another thing that I know they've been trying to work on in Vermont, but even though we fought very hard for civil unions and then we ended up adopting gay marriage in 2008 or nine, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I kind of blanked on that date when we you know, made it marriage, but unions started in 2000. Um, but uh, we don't have a state constitutional amendment on it. And I think that's one way of really securing that right here in Vermont. We have a long constitutional process for a reason. We like to think through things and we want to make sure that it's a permanent solution um, or at least something that we've really thought about and we know that we want. And I think that it's, you know, very established in our society that we want to protect the right to marry. So regardless of what Washington ends up doing on that front, especially if they try banning it nationally, which I don't see them, I, I, I'll be very honest, I don't see them doing that. But if there was an instance of them trying to do that, I mean, we would have to pull out all the cards to protect that here in Vermont. And, you know, the trans community is really yeah. getting slammed uh by the trump administration and um uh we have to find a way i guess to protect people in that regard too i mean i i just read that like the hotline for transgender people has like gone up 30 percent in the last two weeks people feeling really isolated and alone and scared uh, and, you know, there probably will be a national um, law saying that you cannot get um, transition, you cannot transition, you can't get pu puberty blockers before 18 or uh, whatever. I mean, I think that will be an issue. Yeah, I do. I, I agree with that as well. And I'll tell you that I'm already getting calls and emails from people that are trying to change their gender marker on their passports and on their identifications because they don't think that it will be uh, that it will be eligible come you know the next administration when we pass it over um, I think the biggest thing that we can you know talk about at least in Vermont is that we welcome everyone I mean I've been welcomed with open arms by my community and now of course I have the honor to represent Bennington um, but if you come to Vermont and you want to contribute, to our society and you want to be here, um, I think we need to make that a very clear message to people that are coming from all parts of the country. I have a few constituents in fact that have reached out to me, you know, telling me that they moved from out of state um, and that they are transgender and that they said that Vermont has been very welcoming to them, even, you know, and because you know, rural communities in general get a very bad rap for being, you know, uh, not friendly to queer people. But I think that, you know, when it comes to Bennington and communities like us all across Vermont, it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight, if you're cisgender or transgender, you're, you're welcomed because we all are in it together um, and we just got one community. Yeah. And, and have you been assigned a committee or does that happen later? I'm sorry, I don't know no. like how that works. No, you're good. And I'll give people in the audience because I learned this for the first time. So, I mean, I'm going to walk you through it with me right now. So. I thought that you got committee assignments prior to session, but it turns out that you don't know your session until the first day when the speaker announces all the committee lists uh, out loud. Because I've been to an inauguration before, but I hadn't really paid attention to some of the proceedings going on. But every, I believe every legislator, both new and, and returning, they all get their committee assignments um, on the first day of session. And it's kind of like going back to high school, you kind of have to like find your room, you got to find your class, and you got to find out what you're doing. So, I mean, it's like a random picking, you know? <laughs> so can you like say, do you get a choice? Like I would like first this, second this, third this, and then kind of like pick it out of a hat or someone decides or it depends on. So, uh, yep. So I can explain that as well. So I originally, you know, I knew that there would probably be a few options. You get to choose um, five. Now we haven't done those choosings yet, but you get to rank them from your number one to your number five. The speaker, whoever gets elected speaker, uh, both the, uh, the Democratic and Republican caucuses will elect who their party leadership is in the House. And then when we get to session, we'll be charged with electing a new speaker. And both of those uh, people from both caucuses will probably have lists prepared. I don't know exactly this. I'm kind of speculating with this. They'll probably have their list prepared for where they want to place people. And then once we elect the speaker and they announce who 
um, uh, you know, we, we now know the speaker, they'll announce from their slate who gets on what committee. So I, I believe that's how it happens, but the speaker will make the announcement for who they have chosen um, on the opening day of session. So what's your first choice for committee? So uh, I'm kind of tied between two right now because I understand as a freshman kind of coming into the new class, it's, you know, there's certain committees that are designed more for people that are entering. And then there's some that, you know, have been around the block a little bit. So they get some other picks, but my, my two that I feel like I can contribute most to would be either education or government operations and military affairs. So of those two committees, um, I think education would be, you know, maybe the one I would choose over government operations. I, don't hold me to that. If Speaker Kalinske is <laughs> listening, don't, don't write down your list. But, uh, but I think I would probably choose education just because of the fact that I am young and that I have spent a lot of my time in um, you know, the education system. And so I kind of have a very fresh, very unique outlook on how education's changed so much in the past 20 years. Um, we see the introduction of technology, artificial intelligence. We have a lot of things that are coming into the classroom that I didn't have when I was going through elementary and middle school. Um, and having, you know, been in the schools prior to the election, I do part-time substituting. So I, I, I do that from time to time. And that's one of my favorite activities because it kind of gives me a sense of where our young people are at and how, how they're doing. And there's some things that I see and I'm like, great, I'm so glad it's working this way. But then there are some things, of course, that concern me when, you know, I see that we're having high rates of students not attending class when we see behavioral issues that are skyrocketing and we see people in the school system that aren't staying because they've been there 30 years and in the past five years, they have had more disciplinary issues than they have in the past. So it's really grappling with some of those issues. So those are certain things that I'd like to study in the education committee and really have a hand um, to, to, to work with in that committee. I think I read that a lot of, a lot of young people are having trouble in school now because well, one of the was from the pandemic and being home in those very formative years in which, you know, uh, kids learned so much about socialization and, um, um, you know, and in fact, I think I, I read that, you know, it actually affected the brain, the way uh, they matured quicker in their brain, but less in their emotions um, during the pandemic. And that's caused a lot of, um, a lot of trouble for young people who have missed those couple of years there. Yeah, and I'll say from experience, I graduated high school during COVID. And when I went back after the lockdowns were opened and we could go back into the classroom, I kind of had to, I didn't have to rehearse. I don't want to say it like it was a theatrical thing, but I really did have to, you know, make sure I had the right eye contact again. And I knew kind of like social dynamics because we didn't have that for almost in my situation, about nine months and some kids, it was, it was years. It was uh, years. It was years. Yeah. Yeah. And some kids got right back in it, right back in the swing of it very quickly. Um, but I was one that didn't start until, you know, about nine months after, after the initial onset of COVID. And it, and it was a, it was a stumbling block for me and a lot of my friends. I mean, I don't think any of us, you know, had an easy transition back into the classroom when we got back. Yeah. Yeah. We lost our super majority. Yep. Uh, the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And so now it's going to be harder to pass bills in which um, Governor Scott um, vetoes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you foresee that you're going to have uh, an okay time with him trying to compromise with him and his agenda, I mean, he tends to be, I think, socially liberal, but uh, fiscally conservative. Uh, so how do you see your role and how do you feel about, uh, you know, trying to keep Vermont uh, viable and, you know, getting people here to work and um, increasing populations and, you know, what whatever it takes to kind of make this an economically, um, viable place for people to live. 
Well, I can say very firmly that I look forward to working with Governor Scott, and I look forward to working within our caucus on finding solutions that we can we can come together with the Republican caucus on. Um, of course, there's separations of power. The governor has his set of responsibilities he deals with, and the House and the Senate have their separate responsibilities within the legislature. Um, there were several instances of veto overrides where we had, you know, Democratic and Republican, you know, joint support on certain bills um, that Governor Scott didn't support. Um, and, you know, vice versa, there were some bills that Governor Scott agreed with that a lot of people within the Democratic and Republican caucuses didn't support. Um, so I think it really just comes down to some of the specific issues, and I can't forecast what that's going to be because we we don't have the, the, the bill docket yet, so we don't know exactly what bills are going to be proposed. Um, but on my end of things, and I can, you know, speak about this as you know, as a young person who has struggled to find housing um, in the state. And that's why I said, you know, in my biography, I live with my closest friend, Jane. Um, I love Jane very dearly. Um, we came together through mutual friends. And the, the kind of the compromise we came to was I was looking for an apartment. I had a set budget and she had an additional studio that she had not used or rented out in years. And she said, if you want that studio space, I've never rented it out before. It can easily be turned into essentially like a an ADU style, you know, separate living mm -hmm. space. And she said, I would love to just have you near me so that if something were to happen to me or, you know, I just need help with things that you're able to offer me assistance. And so while I was a student, I moved off campus, you know, again, looking for that apartment. Um, but when we kind of brokered, I'll say kind of brokered that deal kind of, you know, more formal, um, it really did a number of benefits for both of us. You know, we both are kind of in the loneliest demographics that we have right now in this country. That's about the 18 to 26 age demographic. That is the loneliest now demographic in our country. And then, of course, you have senior citizens, which traditionally have usually been more on the lonely end of the spectrum because, you know, social networks have been declining because people pass away, people are moving away to be closer to family, and so they get isolated. And so really what it did for us more than an economic benefit was it kind of brought us together socially, and especially after COVID, you know, both of us were wanting to, you know, get out in the social scene again, and we do, we have a lot of the same interest. And so one of the things that I, you know, campaigned on very heavily was the property tax issue. I mean, if viewers leave anything from this, our property tax system is, is broken and it really, it has to be fixed. Um, there's a few things that I'm hoping to introduce that really go down to the calculation of property taxes. But one of the things that I hope that the state can put money towards and allocate resources towards is a property tax rebate and a, and a credit for people like Jane, my good friend, who, um, who have an additional space that they want to convert into a separate living situation where they could have a young professional that wants to live in their community and have a shorter commute to work. You know, giving them that option and that choice and being able to get some kind of financial incentive um, and be able to host someone um, to live with them. And so, you know, I want to make it so that obviously, you know, like me, for example, I had my budget for renting. And now what I'm doing is I'm paying, you know, a subsidized rent rate because I realize there's utilities, there's there's maintenance stuff, you know, and just the general space is valued by her. And also there's a liability and a risk with bringing someone like me into the home. But what I do with that excess is I put it towards and I call it my down payment fund so that one day I can buy a home. And I think, you know, at the rate I'm going in a few years, I might be able to put a down payment on a home and I don't make a crazy amount of money. And as everyone knows, lawmakers don't make that much money, um, which is honestly, I'll say a good thing. I don't want to depend my, my money on lawmaking. I, I like doing my insurance and my, and my other things that I do. Um, but, uh, uh, that, but it does make yeah. that, you know, a lot of people, young yeah. people get serve because yeah. unless they have a wealthy spouse or someone who has making yeah. a lot of money and, you know, uh, or someone who's young and, you know, so it kind of makes for a disparity in, in, in serving in the legislature.
It does. It does. And I don't want to deny that that's part of the yeah. reason why so many people don't serve. For me, I was able to, you know, manage my career outside of the legislature so that I can, you know, maintain those five months and be, you know, consistently in my appeal year. Um, and uh, I apologize. I kind of forget what I was saying about the about the about the property tax rebate. So about, right. how, you know, I put I put my money into my separate fund. And you know that at the rate it's going, I would be able to hopefully put a down payment on a home, you know, on a modest income between legislative stuff and my and my you know my private career. And I don't make a crazy amount of money, or at least that's not what I file on my taxes. It's a very modest amount. So because I do file my taxes, I'll add that. But <laughs> but I but you know I think that's really the way that we're going to change the way people achieve. Um, the American dream and the Vermont dream, owning a home, we just have to make it more obtainable. And solutions like this, because you're adding increased supply to the market, you're allowing people the option to save and get ready to buy a home, it's going to lower rents for everyone that rents. And it's also going to add value to the properties, the neighborhoods. Um, and it just makes sure that we have people that are in our community, that work in our community, and they're there. Now, I just will say I have not introduced that bill yet, but that's something I've spoken with a lot of people. And I'll say across the political spectrum, I've heard people that love this idea. And even you know some people that said, well, I would be willing to consider that if there actually was a rebate or if there was a credit, I'd be willing to host a young person that's working at the hospital or someone that's coming to work at the college so that they have some kind of security. I'd love to have someone check in on me. So it, it, it really would help several issues in Vermont that we're facing right now. Yeah, because I have some senior friends who are really struggling with trying to pay their uh, property taxes, which is some of the highest property taxes in the country, in the, yeah. in the, in the country is in Vermont. The other thing that like a lot of um, states do is when uh, seniors get to a certain age, their um, mortgage never go, their, their tax never goes up. Yep. It stays at where it was. That's I guess one. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, that, that Vermont taxes social security. Um, which is another kind of hardship for um, seniors. So, yeah, I can I can comment on that because there I remember there was a question that I was asked about you know social security tax and, and military pensions. We also tax military pensions. We're one of I think only two states that taxes both of those items. So we're in a very very small group of states that taxes both social security and military pensions. And it seems if you want people to come to the state, you have to offer yep. some of those kind of, you know, cost of living um, incentives. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I have many constituents in Bennington that are five, 10 years away from retirement. And you know what their retirement plan is? They're moving over to New York. They're going to move 10 minutes to the to the West because they get several tax advantages and tax incentives. And you're also right about the property tax freeze once you reach, usually it's 65, but some states vary with when they calculate that. Mm -hmm. um, I know Texas does it that way because my grandmother's taxes were froze a few years back. Um, mm -hmm. But it, but you know what it does is it freezes the rate. You know, it, you know, obviously if she did renovations to the property, I believe it would, it would increase accordingly with that based on that rate that was set. Um, mm -hmm. But also several states have, you know, um, adjustments and measures in place to make sure that property taxes don't change by a certain percentage um, in either direction over over the course of a year into the new fiscal year. We don't have any right. things like that in Vermont. And one of the things that, you know, from what I've studied with the, with the property tax system, and uh, this is going to get like really into the weeds, but I'll sum it up quick, is when you look at your property tax I think it's on the property tax bill, but it's at least baked into the system. They do a common level of appraisement or appraisal. So that CLA is factored to the rate. So they, you know, appraise whatever homes uh, in the town right. every year. And based on how off that is from fair market value, that's the CLA. And essentially what that does is it multiplies the tax rate. So the mm -hmm. further off your, your appraisals are, from fair market value, the bigger swing you have in property taxes. And so in some of these small towns, 
there's large properties and there's, and there's, you know, large home sales that happen where either they're very overvalued or very undervalued. And that swings the whole town's property tax rates without, without it necessarily being fair or just. So, you know, Bennington, you know, we were very upset even with a 4% tax increase. And there were some towns, these very small communities, they were seeing a 32, 35% tax increase this past year. And part of that's because of that CLA. So what I was going to detail was just that we're hoping, I'm hoping to partner with some folks on introducing a bill to change the common level of appraisal from it being town by town but starting to do it more regionally. So still having that town weight that benefits larger towns that have a bigger pool, but also bringing in some of these smaller towns into the pool. So it'll, it'll make sure that all of our towns more or less have about the same property tax adjustment. And it's not these wild swings in property tax <laughs> that we've seen, because that's the problem. People want consistency. They want low taxes, but at the end of the day, yeah. you budget and you, and you make a budget and you know what you're gonna spend on property tax you know, every year. And when you have a fixed income, like on social security, or if you're, you know, an average employee and you know what your salary is going to be for the next couple of years, you budget things like that. And so it does, you know, take a, you know, it does take a lot out of you when there is a big swing like that. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to ask you um, one more question mm -hmm. before our, our time is up here. Um, but, um, You know, the property tax here was the same as my parents who lived in Boston. Um, and, you know, that's pretty. But the one thing I wanted to ask you about is I think one of the things that, and, you know, you, please correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things that really drives up prices in all states, and, and this one included, I think, is healthcare costs for state employees, for uh, teachers, um, that if we had a, um, a single payer um, yeah. system, we wouldn't have all that. What really drives costs up is insurance, right? I mean, uh, medical and all of that for all the employees. So do you think there's any chance that Vermont could get a single payer um, system, or do you think that's like somewhere out in the future somewhere? I think that's, I'll be very honest, not to be a Debbie Downer, but it's yeah. going to be very far out in the future. Um, in terms of short term healthcare cost, um, obviously we're seeing the issues with the hospitals around the state. I'm sure we oh, all yeah. saw. You know, medical center has also taken a lot out of their budget and they've they've cut down on hours and staff and, and beds and you know all sorts of things basically the exact opposite of what we need right now i know it's awful <laughs> but what we also saw was that vermont had some of the highest um insurance rate premium spikes in the, in the country of all the affordable care it was like 14 percent last month yep. last time yeah, and, and if you look at the Affordable Care, um, the Affordable Care Act's marketplace, uh, two of them, I believe, went up 15 and 12 percent, respectively. Um, and so that was a major that was a major increase that we didn't really see all across the country. One way to combat that, and it's going to take partnership with our New England states and some of the you know the Northeast cohort of states, is if we were to enter into a common marketplace instead of being divided the way we are, because we'd have more people in the insurance pool, we'd have more, more people that are regulating the cost. So it would, it would slow down this major increase we're seeing. So instead of getting a 12 or 15% increase, we might see a three or 4% increase in future years. But if Vermont were to join some of our other states, I believe our rates would actually go down. I don't know the legality of all of that under federal and statute states, but, but I would obviously try my best to research it. Because I'm thinking like, you know, I, I'm really, maybe I'm really naive about this, but, you know, I'm thinking when, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield says, oh, we need 14% interest. I mean, why aren't legislators just saying, no, sorry, not yeah. getting it. Yeah, my, I'll just say, you know, for viewers, I'm fine discussing my health insurance premiums. And I'll also mention my father because there's two stories here, but when I, uh, got on my plan last year, my monthly premium was about $417. I'm a healthy 21 year old on a Blue Cross plan. 
and, it, and it's a good plan because I don't want to obviously get sick and, you know, have to mm -hmm. put in a large bill, but my premium is so ridiculous. Um, but so my, my monthly premium is about 400 and 17 dollars somewhere in that range. Well, because of Blue Cross's increase, I'm going to be at almost five hundred dollars a month. That's that kind of inconsistency. I was not budgeting for that, and so the question is: Do I go shop for another plan? Do I withhold insurance altogether? I mean, there's there's several things that I could do, yeah. um, but I don't really that I don't really want to do. But those are the hard questions that we as individuals have to make around this when we don't have a single pair model or at least a public option where we can buy into it. I think that's something that Vermont can start exploring is some kind of public option. I can see that being something in the short term, but I think that is, you know, been a difficult thing that the past decade has shown it's going to take a lot of political maneuvering and, and willpower to get it through. And, you know, insurance before, I don't know, when was it Nixon or Reagan or somebody was um, nonprofit. Yeah, and there are examples, and I think Vermont, Isn't that like Kaiser in California. Uh -huh. Yeah, and there's uh -huh. there's uh, I know that there's some. Uh, it, it's an interesting take. There's some religious organizations that offer kind of in-house medical insurance, and I think they call it MediShare or something like that. Essentially, where they share the burden of their congregation or many congregations. But obviously we get into issues, you know, with separation of church and state, but figuring out a model like that would be very interesting and that, you know, that could potentially be done. But Linda, the answer to that question is going to take a long time to get to a single pair model. <laughs> okay. All right. I got it. And look how dark my room is getting. I was going to say it is getting dark. Out. I know. I think because you're facing out and I'm facing <laughs> away from the windows. <laughs> so anyway, we're... Um, I think we're 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 up with time here, and I really really enjoyed speaking to you, and I really enjoyed um, talking to you, and I'm sure we'll see you at the state house. Uh, myself and my cohorts are really politically um, interested in hanging out and in the cafeteria now and again, and dragging people around and saying, you know, what are you doing about this? And what are you doing about that? Oh. So. Well, I was I'm just sure saying, Linda, you. thank you so much for bringing me on. I'm glad to be able to speak to you and everyone else that'll listen to this. And if I do see you in the state house, pull me aside and you know talk to me. And I would love to meet all your friends and your cohort. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you hang in there and um, enjoy. When does your session start? January. Yeah, it starts the first week of January. All right. Yeah. Well, you enjoy. We'll see you at the state house, and. Um, Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.